Safety is of utmost importance in cases of emergencies, like health crisis. But this should not impede learning. Students should be allowed to continue learning in the safety of their homes. Vibal brings you the Smart Homeschool Kit. The Smart Homeschool Kit offers complete tools for a homeschool setup while encouraging collaboration between teachers and parents. This kit contains the following. First, Smart Wizard. These workbooks provide age-appropriate supplementary activity sheets to challenge learners' understanding of the lessons and help them put their learnings into practice. A teacher's guide that serves as a manual for monitoring the learning progress of students at home is also available in the kit. This kit also contains a parent's guide to assist parents in guiding their children while learning at home. Daily lessons are made available in Smart Class. Aside from lessons, these books feature performance tasks aligned with DEPED's K-12 curriculum, good for an entire school year. And to monitor students' learning progression at home, Smart Homeschool Kit also features the Smart HMS, an online monitoring system designed for homeschool learning with features including assignment of lessons and tasks to students, and tracking of learners' progress through analytics. Get the Smart Homeschool Kit today. Email marketing at vibalgroup.com for more details. Good day, Kabibal, and welcome to our Facebook Live session. For the discussion today, the topic will be on Facilitating Classes in the Sciences Through New Pedagogies. Before we begin, take note of the following reminders. First, you have to make sure you are registered to the webinar to have your e-certificate of participation. Visit certificate.vivalgroup.com to generate your proof of attendance. Place your questions on the comment box allotted during the session and they will be addressed by our speaker later on. Share the video using hashtag LearnAsOnePH as our official hashtag to our Vival webinars. Experience learning, Kabival. And now to proceed with our webinar this morning, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished speaker for today. Dr. Elmer Mojica obtained his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Agricultural Chemistry at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. He taught for a year at Cavite State University, and then he continued teaching at his alma mater while pursuing his MS degree. He left the Philippines in 2005 to pursue his PhD in Chemistry at University of Buffalo and acquired it in 2010. He moved to New York City to work as a postdoc at CUNY York College. He also worked there as an adjunct faculty at one time and another in different colleges such as Mercy College, St. Francis College, Bronx Community College, Borough of Manhattan Community College, and York College. In fall of 2011, he started working at Pace University as a lecturer and then as an assistant professor and later promoted to associate professor at his present position at the Department of Chemistry and Physical Sciences. As a researcher, Dr. Mojica is specialist in analytical chemistry, having worked on various instrumental techniques such as chromatography, spectroscopy, and electrochemistry, analyzing samples of interest in to biochemistry, nutrition, food, food science, and environmental science. He has also been the recipient of several awards such as UPLB College of Arts and Sciences Outstanding Junior Faculty in 2003 and Outstanding Teacher Assistant from the Department of Chemistry in 2000, 2007 and Graduate School in 2010. While at, at UB, 
In 2013, he was the first recipient of the Excellence in Research and Scholarship during Pace University Research Day. He was also a recipient of several teaching awards from different teaching organizations, the latest of which is the 2020 Charles and Homer Pace Teaching Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Elmer Rico E. Mojica. much Michelle for that uh, kind introduction okay so magandang araw po sa inyong lahat dyan sa Pilipinas uh, maayong buntag and to my uh, hometown Buenos Dias so today I would like to discuss on how we did uh, classes facilitating classes in the sciences through new pedagogies okay so I'm Elmer uh, Mojica I'm presently an uh, associate professor at Pace University and an adjunct uh, associate professor in York College in City University of New York, also here in New York City. So Pace University is a private non-sectarian university that has two campuses, one in Westchester campus and the other one in uh, downtown New York City. So it's easy to find our school Okay, if you're standing on Brooklyn Bridge, this is our school. We are being dwarfed by the more famous uh, spiral building known as the Gary Building. And this is how Pace University looks like in front uh, uh, of the uh, building. So behind it is the New York City Hall. Okay, so you may ask why we have this webinar today. Okay, so all of you are preparing for the so-called new normal. Unfortunately for us, we already passed the transition phase. So what I'm trying, I'm going to do today, uh, to, today to you there is to give you, okay, what are the stuff that we did when we do transition and to share to you the experience that we have. So as Oscar Wilde says, uh, the author of the picture of Dor Dorian Gray, experience is the hardest kind of teacher. It gives you the first first and the lesson afterward. And the same author states also that experience is one thing you can get for nothing. Okay, so half of my lecture is about the different pedag uh, pedagogies that uh, I have done uh, during the transition, and then uh, some experience that we have during the uh, what we call transition to remote learning, and some guide for you as you prepare for the new normal. So as we go to this uh, topic of pedagogy, it came from the Greek word paidagogos, in which paida means child and agog uh, means uh, lead. And it's translated to lead the child. So pedagogy is the art and science of teaching children. It is the science because it's the knowledge of theories of learning and st instructional strategies for teaching. It is the art because it's correctly putting theories into practice and building up teaching experiences. So they said, this is the heart of teaching profession. And it plays a critical uh, part in the core role of the school, okay? So if we're going to look at the importance of this pedagogy, okay? We are just some of the stuff why it is important. So a thoroughly, uh, develop pedagogy improves the quality of learning. It makes the students more receptive during the learning session. So this improves the students' uh, level of participation in the teacher learning process, okay? The pedagogy also help imparts knowledge to students with different learning styles or abilities. And lastly, okay, when you have a thoughtful, uh, thoughtfully developed pedagogy, it makes students develop higher level of cognitive skills, okay? So those are the importance. Now, what are the factors that affect okay, this pedagogy? Okay, the first one we could say is the competence of the instructor. So usually a competent teacher keeps the students motivated, interested, and eager to learn, okay? And also, you have to consider the learning styles of the students. You cannot have a one-size-fits-all because students have different uh, learning ability, okay? 
And the field of study. If you are in sciences, you have to do what? Laboratory classes. But if you are in political science, I don't think you need to do some laboratory class, okay? And then availability of additional resources. So this is in the form of what? Projectors, virtual laboratories. It helped widen the uh, teaching and learning process. So such educational resources keep the learning sessions alive and students engage. And last but not the least, okay, the education system. So the policies of an educational system, curriculum standards, etc., also influence the pedagogical approach. Now, what are the types of the pedagogical approach? Now, to tell you frankly, to give you uh, an information, I'm not, uh, we could say, uh, formally educated in education. I was trained as a scientist. So these things to me are what we call, I never learned them formally. I just learned them when I start teaching, okay? So the first types of the pedagogical approach is we could say the contractivist, okay? So in the contractivist, usually it allows the learners to be active in the process of constructing meaning and knowledge rather than positively receiving okay, information. So from the word itself, construct, okay? So contractivist means constructing the knowledge in the learner's mind. So we could say this is more on active learning. Okay, and usually contractivist view, we use it in chemistry, especially in the lecture portion. So we use it before the pandemic, or we could say the old normal. Now, the reflective approach on the other hand, okay, it keeps a regular check on their teaching pedag uh, pedagogy where they observe and check the suitability of pedagogy in a teaching learning setup. Now, this is more appropriate, we could say, to those who are in education, those who are doing student teaching. Okay? Before the normal, uh, the, uh, before, uh, during the old normal, we don't use, at least in chemistry, the reflective approach. But as we go shift to the new normal, you will see what will happen. And then we have this so called collaborative. Uh, approach. So the collaborative approach requires students to, to work together in small teams. So this is best evidenced by the laboratory class. Okay, so we group students together and what they do, they collaborate with one another and do experiments. Okay, we could say collaborative uh, approach is also applicable if students are doing thesis, especially if their thesis are uh, related with one another. Okay. So here, the, the setup that we have in a collaborative approach is a research-oriented setup. This small team may also comprise of a teacher and a researcher. So I mentor some undergrad, as uh, this uh, uh, said during the introduction. Now, the other approach that we have is integrated. Okay? So this relates classroom education with real-world uh, applications. So students here, Okay, are uh, what we call involves in learning with the teachers in facilitating of learning. So whenever you have this uh, pedagogy of integration, it has four objectives, making sense of the learning process, differentiating matters by relevance, applying the learning to practical situation and associating the learned elements. Now this approach is useful in science courses like the chemistry that I'm teaching. And last but not the least, we have the inquiry-based approach. So in this approach, we put the student at the center of the learning process. Here, students ask questions and use res uh, reasoning and problem-solving skills to reach a solution. And usually, the inquiry-based approach may be of four types, Confirm uh, confirma uh, confirmation, structured, guided, and open. And inquiry based, that's also one of the approach that we use for uh, laboratory session. Now, usually they said, when you do inquiry based, you just follow the letters in the word inquire. You investigate your surroundings, you narrow your focus, you question, okay? You uncover your prediction, 
you in initiate an action plan and then you research and data collection and then you examine the results and communicate uh, your findings. So as you could see, it is not only applicable in the laboratory class, it's also applicable if students do thesis, okay? So usually in sciences, one of the requirements for them to graduate is they do an independent research and present it as a thesis, okay? Now, in addition to the types of this pedagogical approach, we also have this what we call forms of pedagogical approach. Now, usually we, we only know two, okay? One that is, we could say, teacher-centered, where it positions the teacher at the center of the learning process and typically relies on methods such as full class lecture, rote mo memorization, and chorus answer with the call and response. Now, they said this is not a very good approach, especially if the students don't want to participate. Students usually in this role are passive. Now, the other one, it's the student or the learner that takes the center stage. So it generally draw, uh, uh, draws on the learning theories like the contractivist uh, uh, theory or approach suggesting learners should play an active role in the learning process, okay? Now, there is a new one and some book I think don't even uh, consider them. Okay, we have this so-called learning-centered pedagogy. This is a relatively new term, okay? So it suggests the teacher should be flexible and carefully adopt their pedagogical approaches based upon the school environment. So for me, I try to be flexible. So depending on the environment, okay, I want the students to be the active learner, not me telling the students, you have to do this, you have to do this, or you have to memorize this. And you will see what happened okay, when we shift to the uh, new normal because everybody knows COVID-19, right? COVID-19 has interrupted classroom learning for at least nine out of 10 students worldwide. UNESCO reported that 191 countries close schools and affect around 1.5 billion students from pre-primary to tertiary education. And unfortunately, almost half of all the students affected worldwide uh, face barriers to online learning during the school closures. So if you're going to look worldwide, around 826 million do not have a household computer. That's 50% of the learners. And then 706 million do not have an household internet or 40% of the 43% of the learners. And worse, 56 million doesn't have any access to mobile phones. And I think the Philippines form, uh, fall into that category. Okay. So what are we going to do when we go to the new normal in education, especially there in the Philippines? So either we go online or most of the students will go sideline, as shown here in the cartoon from uh, bulatlat.com. Okay, so that's, that's the sad part, okay? But to tell you frankly, 2020 is not really kind to us. So maybe at the start of the year, which for us is the spring semester, it's like this, okay? You draw the horse just like a horse. And then the middle of the, what we call semester, during March, we were told that we're going to do remote learning or remote teaching. So how are we going to finish that thing? At least the, uh, in the Philippines also, you start the year, you're fine. And then all of a sudden, some are affected by the Taal volcano eruption. Okay, but in the middle of the semester, some school continues, but most of the school close. So what happened? Okay, so come the term pandemic pedagogy. And if you're going to combine the bold letters they have put there, I call it the phonic gogi. Okay, so what is phonic gogi? Okay, if not interpreted properly, you may end up with this Star Wars title. So in the original uh, Star Wars title based on the episode, this is the listing. But if you end up not teaching, okay, correctly, and you just base it from the scene or from the story of each movie, you might end up with the new title, just scrambling the titles that we have. So for instance, episode one, introduction of Anakin Skywalker. So you can title it as The Rise of Skywalker. 
Episode 2, Palpatine. Okay? Commission the Clone Army. Palpatine is a seed, so you have the Revenge of the Sith. Episode 3, Order 66, where the clones attack the Jedi. So you could title it now as Attack of the Clones. Okay? Episode 4, when Luke Skywalker is introduced and Obi-Wan Kenobi come back, so you could say it's Return of the Jedi. Okay? Episode 5, Yoda, okay, trains Luke Skywalker, okay, so the Force awakens in him. In episode 6, Yoda died, so Luke Skywalker becomes the last Jedi. Okay, episode 6, the Empire returns, so you can say it's Empire Strikes Back. Episode, uh, ep that's episode 7. Episode 8, Luke trains Rey to give the Resistance a new hope. Okay, in episode 9, the emperor returns and he is the phantom menace. So if it's not what we call have a good transition, you may end up with this one. So I don't know if it's good or bad, okay? Or you could say it, the, the working conditions that we have on how Darth Vader choked. Usually in the normal condition, this is what happened. And then if it's social distancing, it's like this. And if it's work from home, it's like this. But still, the, the other person died with the choke that he had. Okay, so what is this so-called pandemic pedagogy? You know, we don't really have uh, the term that we have here, okay? It's just a mixture of what we call the pedagogies that I have mentioned like uh, before. So the way I call this pedagogy that we have is flexible learning pedagogy, okay? And if we're going to look at the uh, form, this is the learning-centered approach, but based more on the student centered. So you're just adapting all mentioned types of the pedagogy approach. Okay. So if we're going to look at this, this is built, this flexible learning pedagogy, this is built on the strong pedagogical beliefs that I have mentioned. Okay. And the flexible learning uh, pedagogy that we have here is focus more on active learning and collaborative learning. So what happened here? Contract this, we still continue with the lecture problems that we use. But we now incorporate reflective. How? Because we don't know what we're doing with the setup that we have. So from time to time, I ask my student to comment whenever they have an exam, whenever they have to do something that they had never done before, I want them to put that stuff in the discussion board. So in that instance, I reflect if my teaching is good, they also reflect if they understand my teaching. So that's, that doesn't happen during the old normal. In the new normal, I incorporate this, what we call pedagogy. And then the collaborative class, although, okay, we never meet face to face. I found out that my students, even though we meet online, they communicate with one another. They're helping one another to answer some of the experiment. And in this coming uh, fall, where we have this in-person laboratory class, okay, collaborative approach is going to be helpful because the way that we're going to do the collaborative, uh, the, the in-person laboratory class is following CDC protocol of 25% occupancy. So we're going to group the students into four and then each experiment will be done by one member and then the next meeting another member. So that one member who do the experiment is responsible to gather all the data that is going to uh, give to the other members who didn't do it. So I would say that's a collaborative approach. Integrative, we're still doing that. Lecture and lab class. Why? Because I'm as I'm going to mention later on, we adopted some simulations. We adopted some videos, okay? because we try to uh, tell the students that what they're doing is related in the real world, okay? And the last one, the inquiry base, since the lab is still running, I'm going to tell you how it's being run, okay? We still, uh, what we call adapted, that thing, okay? So as you could see here, we just adapted all available pedagogies that we have, okay? And I read one article, about the so-called transition to new normal. So the, uh, the author from Malaysia mentioned that there are four aspects that you need to look to is the transition to the new normal. 
Okay, so she mentioned here three ships. The first ship is learning space. So how is the ship of learning space? It's a ship from public space to personal space. Public in the form of school. So what happened during the transition to remote learning? Okay, personal space to the student's place, usually home. Okay, so going to school and university that uh, what we call, we are, there's a premise for you to learn. Now learning happens at home within the student's personal space. Now, along with the ship of learning space, there's also a ship in the so-called social interaction from physical to virtual, okay? So we have merely shifted our means of communication channels, but we're still do doing the same. There's still communications between students and the teacher. Another uh, aspect that you need to consider is the ship of delivery. The ship of delivery of the teaching modes or the teaching methods. So before what happened? One size fits all. Why did I say one size fits all? In a typical class, all students will be taught okay, the same. They listen to the same lecture, do the same activities in class, and complete the same homework assignment. And at the end of the semester, all students will sit okay, for the same exam and will be evaluated based on the same rubric. But in the new normal, you cannot do that. You have to consider the so-called individualized and differentiated learnings. So you're going to teach students uniquely to meet their unique needs and paces. So that's one of the things okay, that you need to consider. Another thing that you need to consider is shift of responsibility in the teaching and the learning process. Now, since the personal space now is at home, so who are the people at home? Okay, the family members, the household members. So now that learning takes place in personal spaces, so most likely in the student's home, okay, the family members become active participants in the teaching and the learning process. Okay, so you can tap the entire household as learning facilitators, providing guidance and assistance to make the learning process pleasant for students. And the last shift that we need to consider, the last aspect that we need to consider is shift in learning evaluation. So before we assess, especially in science, using what? Final exam, summative uh, assessment. But what happened is when we shift to this uh, new normal, you have to consider the formative assessment, okay? Unless you have some uh, what we call software to monitor them during the uh, exam, okay? So there, you have to provide an alternative means of evaluating learning, okay? So that's the challenge that, that I am encountered and also trying to solve as, as of this time. So as they said, there's two forms of assessment, formative and sum, uh, summative. So when you say formative, okay, this is based on uh, monitoring student learning to provide ongoing feedback that can be used by instructor to improve the teaching. But the summative there, you are already evaluating or assessing your students on how much they learn. And as you could see, the formative assessments usually low stakes, the summative assessment is high stakes. And that's, I, I would say, is the main problem, okay? So the way that they, they discuss the ship here is, there's a ship that's focused from assessment of learning to assessment for learning, okay? So, what pace are you now? So if you're going to look at this, okay? So these are the different paces of higher education response to COVID. For me, I would say I'm already in phase three. Phase one, phase two, so in phase one, we have a rapid transition to remote learning and teaching. And then after the semester is gone, we need, we, we do some re-evaluation. 
we are asked to take the so-called online teaching certification. Okay, and now we are waiting for the fall semester. And just to show you the experience that I have during the remote learning, I have uh, taught during the spring semester when the shift to remote learning okay, started and continued to teach during the summer. Okay? And during this time, I taught in two institutions. Okay? Pace University, I have the GenChem Lecture and Lab Instrumental Method, and in the summer, the GenChem Lecture and Lab. And then in your college, I, do, uh, I, I taught GenChem Lecture and Instrumental Methods, and in the summer, Instrumental Methods. Okay? So if I'm going to discuss to you the transition that we have, I have to suspend the research activities. Lecture transition is a little bit easier. From a physical blackboard, we went to a virtual blackboard. That's our LMS, Learning Management System. The laboratory, we could say, it's a little bit challenging. Okay, I'm going to discuss the transition this and how uh, we move to the so-called neuro. So research activity, this is my group at the end of fall. I usually have one dozen. And then this is uh, the last activity that we have before we went to lockdown. And by the end of the semester, okay, we only meet by Zoom, okay? So what happened? Since the school is closed, all physical research activity were suspended, okay? We're supposed to present on the last week of March in the American Chemical Society uh, national meeting in Philadelphia, it was canceled. Three students were able to finish their thesis because there's a requirements for them. At present, I don't do any physical research, mostly virtual, computational calculations and processing of data. Okay, lecture class, we have an option to use Zoom or Blackboard. So I use Zoom if the students continue to show their pace, but once they go behind the black, uh, what we call the uh, color, I go to Blackboard, okay? So those who have been my student before in the previous class, we were, were able to use Zoom at the, until the end of the semester, okay? And since we have the schedule, we have the so-called synchronous class. For those who are not able to attend, we record the session and made them available, okay? And then I posted recorded short slides for problem solving because I always do that to them, okay? Uh, following this constructive, uh, constructive uh, approach, okay? And then if they need to meet me, we uh, set our appointment and meet in Zoom. So the challenge that we have is how to make them more engaged during the class, okay? Now, during this transition, most of the universities use Zoom. So overnight, we were uh, dubbed as Zoom University. And this is one of the points that came up. So it says here, I will teach you in a room. I will teach you now on Zoom. I will teach you in your house. I will teach you with the mouse. I will teach you here and there. I will teach you because I care. So just do your very best and do not worry about the rest. Okay? So we have problems in the lecture class. Not all of them are attending. Okay? And unfortunately, one of the reasons is some students are affected by the COVID-19. New York City was the center of pandemic. Some of my students' close relatives pass away from COVID-19, okay? Assessment has always been a problem because what happened, they have to ship at the middle of the semester. We allow them to have open note during exam, okay? And one thing that happened during that time is the checking. So check is a, a private company that builds on uh, what we call tutoring. So we found out all questions in text bank are available online. So when I did an exam from an average score of 57, the second exam is 82. So what I did, I did some modification. It went back to 60 and 62. Although we have a software to monitor them while they take the exam, I think it's just too much for them during the shift to remote learning to use that. But I, I did use that during the summer. So at least the assessment is still uh, using the summative uh, assessment exam, okay? Now the laboratory class options, and I think some uh, of the participants are, because, uh, are here because of this. 
what do we do? We have several choices. Okay, we have several options. The first one, we did not do the labs. And I think some schools are not going to do the labs there. At least uh, what we call semester. Virtual labs, simulations, use videos related to experiments and the classic home-based experiment. Now the option that we have here now in the laboratory class, the objective now is to make the laboratory useful to reinforce the concept discussed in the lecture. For them to gain hands-on knowledge or lab skills, we can do that, okay? Virtual labs, although most of this company offer us free as promotion, okay? To the point that we're going to use it during uh, fall, okay? We didn't get anything because we said the students are going to adjust and if you're going to use a virtual lab, they will adjust again. And we don't want to give a hard time to our students during that shift to remote learning, okay? Simulations, so maybe the, uh, our audience can look at them, okay? They're free. All you need to do is what? Internet access, okay? The pet uh, simulations that are here, you can download them and then you can play them uh, offline. They're free and they cover different what we call uh, courses. Lab exchange is more on biochemistry, okay? Uh, this one, the open educational resources, it covers a lot of what we call the courses, not only sciences. And this one, the water plant, this is more on physics, okay? So it gives you all simulation. I utilize some of them, okay? Just as an addition to this inquiry-based approach and integrative ways, uh, integrative approach okay, in this uh, new normal when we shift to uh, what we call remote learning. Now, the one that we use so that the students will have less adjustment to do is the video-based experiment. That's, that's the best option that we have, okay? I have used video to reinforce lecture and laboratory. I usually teach courses that are off semester, okay? So when I say off semester, the schedule is usually night class once a week. So it's a challenge for me to engage them. So what I did is I utilized video clips from movies, TV series, and YouTube videos. And I was able to get the paper out of it, okay? And then this semester, I'm going to use this uh, videotaping experiments in analytical chemistry uh, lab. So what we did here is we video the experiment that being done in that course. So this is going to be helpful for us, at least for me, this coming fall semester. Although uh, we could say there are a lot of videos available in YouTube. All you need to do is just type what topic you want. And we're able to prepare this summer. I prefer the Gen Chem Lab for our what uh, for our class, for our uh, department, and my instrumental lab analysis. Although I still believe that it's very different if you do hands-on experiment. Okay, you see, uh, do, when you do titration, you use what uh, burette with a receiving plus. Compare if you do virtual labs, you're going to use your mouse. The experience is still, is really different, in my opinion. Although there's a paper that tells us that studies show that lack of hands-on experience did not negatively affect the performance of the online student. So siguro consuelo de bobo na lang natin yun. But I still believe hands-on uh, experiment, okay, over the BGB. We just that we just don't have any choice. Now, the last option that we have is the home-based experiment. So we have online classes that have uh, experiments and most of these experiments is home-based. So we have these commercially available lab kits in combination with household items provided the means to conduct experiment. I think Bibal has some of these item also, okay? Although you can develop your own, but we have safety issues here. Here in the US, it's what we call common to be sued or you can sue somebody. So since the company don't want any legal li liabilities, if there's an accident in the kit, we didn't uh, what we call adopt it, okay? However, you in the Philippines, I would say you can use it. But when you do home-based experiment, please avoid adopting the traditional lab experiments and then directly convert it to online environment. I would suggest 
when you develop your home-based experiment, think SAFE, S-A-F-E, okay? Safety, affordability, feasibility, and engageability. So first of all, it should be safe. Second, it should be affordable. So even uh, students from poor uh, areas can do it. Feasibility, it can be done. And engageability, it can create curiosity to the students. And the only options that you have there, we could say is the kitchen chemistry. Why? If you can eat it, that means it's safe. Okay, how can you do some activities on that? Well, all of us cook rice, right? Yung bigas, matigas, yung kanin, malambot. So what's the changes that happen there? You can also explain like the ripening of fruit. Bakit yung saging, paghilaw, mapakla, paghinog, matamis. Okay, so those are just some stuff that you can develop without even spending okay, money. But it can help your students uh, think. So they can have a constructivistic approach there, inquiry approach, okay? So I think that's the best option if you want to do a uh, home-based experiment, the kitchen chemistry. And I have presentations of that in my other webinar, okay? Now, whenever you design lab experiments, you have to ask this following question. What do students need to learn from lab courses? So here you're already uh, using all this uh, pedagogy, uh, pedagogy approach, okay? What is the important thing the student need to know in a given experiment? And how are you going to know if they learn? Again, assessment na naman, okay? And once you're able to answer those questions, you can apply the backward design, the so-called begin the end concept. What does that, what does it mean? You start at the end result and then you work backward, okay? And in doing that, you modify the learning outcome. So whenever I do the lab, okay, the development of hands-on skills is already gone, but I focus more on data processing and analysis. Why? I give the, I give the students a set of data. Okay, and you should be able to process it, analyze and interpret. I focus more on the writing skills and to see if he really understand, I ask them to design experiments. So here they have to use their imagination. Okay, so that's constructivism. Now, some of the stuff that you need to, re to, to remember when you go to this, uh, what we call pandemic pedagogy, uh, pedagogy okay, is let's just move everything online. That's not really true. Okay? You have to consider the situation and make adjustment, especially in, the, in our country. Not all of us can do it online. Okay? Another thing that you can need to do, things will be easier because everyone is home. No, it will be harder because everyone is home. Okay? And then, don't ever think that you can prepare extensively to cover everything because as much as possible, the students can only absorb chunks of knowledge. So you have to prepare brief sessions to focus on the main points, okay? So the next slide that I have here is just what some of the advice based on what I learned. So in the new normal, maybe this is how I look like. Triple protection, two face masks and one face shield. Okay, and the first thing that you're going to need to do is you have to buy to the mode of teaching. What does it mean? Dapat mabenta sa inyo kung ano yung mode teaching nyo. Kasi ibibenta nyo yan sa mga estudyante. So what I read, DepEd will, uh, what we call, adopt this thing. Face-to-face, -face, homeschool study, distance learning, or blended learning. And Sir Popoy said in chat, okay, it will be flexible learning. Now, to tell you frankly, when they told us that we're going to ship to remote learning or distance learning, the first thing that came to my mind is what? We're going to do modules. Good for us. We didn't do it. Why? Because they explained to us what are we going to do. And we only have one week to prepare. And that is our spring break. At least you there, you have what? Months to prepare yourself. And at least now some of you have already the knowledge on how to do it. And 
this is the one that explained to us that what we're going to do is not what we know as the online learning. So when we're talking about online learning, ito yung ino-offer ng UPOU. Okay? So Professor Jason Wrench ex uh, explained it in one of his blog that the online learning that we know is planned. Its development time is one to two years prior. It has an intentional and guided instructional development. Now, the online learning that we're going to do, which since then was known as remote learning, it's emergent due to a crisis. It has to be done immediately. It is a hazard and emergent, okay? So what we do in the remote learning is trying to simulate the face-to-face -face environment, but doing it online, doing it virtually. And another thing that makes the difference is the so-called andragogy. So if the pedagogy is the art and science of uh, teaching children, uh, andragogy is the art and science of adult learning, okay? So the remote learning that we have, and some of you that you're going to do, that's the best practices that we have during this pandemic. And if you're going to furthermore uh, differentiate the two, engagement is going to be a problem in the remote learning, okay? So yun yung difference. So dahil dyan, nabenta sa akin. So I was able to explain to, the, to my students, what are we going to do? And at the same time, that's the only option that we have. So the first thing that we usually do is choose the LMS. Unfortunately, I think not all of you will have this. Okay? So if you have an, uh, an LMS, that's your distance learning toolbox. So I have Blackboard on both institutions, although we're going to shift to Desire to Learn or Brightspace. My wife has the Google Meet. But there in the Philippines, I think the, the most common one is the Google Meet, okay? Now, if you don't have an LMS, what you do is modules, right? Uh, I asked a friend of mine who's doing it there in the Philippines and they said, this is what he did. Uh, he's from uh, Professor Sabtula in Sambuanga. So he followed the 5E, the BSCS uh, model. Okay, I think it's bi biological science curriculum series. So it says engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. And this is an example of an inquiry-based approach, pedagogy. Okay. Now you already from you're already familiar with the term synchronous and asynchronous. If it's a 100% online courses, it's asynchronous. The only time it becomes synchronous is when the students meet with the tutor. Now, the face-to-face, -face, on the other hand, is ma a majority synchronous learning. And the only time you have the synchronous if you ask them to do assignments. So what you're going to do now is some sort of a flip the classroom, okay? Most students, based on the feedback that they got, prefer the asynchronous because they are not motivated if they don't meet their teacher, okay? The use of modules in most of the schools that we have would mean asynchronous. But my advice to you is stop the social media for synchronous activity if you don't have the LMS, okay? Skype, Zoom, Facebook, like what we're doing right now, or YouTube, okay? Whatever happened, try to reach out to them, maybe once a week, okay? So the synchronous, what we did is since we have a schedule of class, we hold a, syn a synchronous session. And then we record that session for those students who didn't attend, okay? And then I, I prepare additional materials. That's why I invest with the writing pad and the microphone for the asynchronous activity, okay? Assessment, as I have told you, that will be the main big question. For us here, we're lucky because we have software to monitor them during the exam. Because in most sciences, the best assessment that we have is the exam. So you have to top already the formative assessment. Can you top quizzes? Then what we call the uh, formative exam? Because sometimes it is a high stakes. Okay? It is open for uh, what we call ground for cheating, academic dishonesty. 
And if you have the means, you can always pay someone to take the exam on your behalf. Okay? Now, what's my advice to you? Once you get the list of your students, you connect with them. Once we are informed that we're going to do remote learning or distance learning, what I did is I connect with the students. I survey them about the situation that they have. I ask them if they have the uh, computer and the internet line and what are the worries that they have if we go to the remote learning and the inputs that they have there, okay, I take into consideration. That's why I held some uh, asynchronous uh, session or we could say uh, materials that they can do asynchronously. So as much as possible, I would suggest you establish connection with your students as early as possible. You get the, once you get the list, contact them as soon as possible, okay? Because I have always believed that great teachers focus not on compliance, but on connections and relationships. Ask for help. When the pandemic happened, I asked the colleagues of mine uh, from uh, Institute of Chemistry, UP Los Banos, who are teaching around here in the US. And I was introduced to this, what we call group in Facebook. And all chemistry faculty was there. So I would suggest do the same thing there in our country. Uh, Filipino Science Hub, we're doing it. Bibal is doing it, okay? Because the next thing that I ask is what we're doing right now, learn as one uh, Philippines. We are all in this together. We have to adopt the so-called Bayanihan spirit, okay? You have to explain to your students why we have this present setup. Because if you tell them online, baka madiscarry sila, okay? Because I believe we have to come together, okay? Coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success from Henry Ford. And as Malcolm X said, when I replace the we, even the illness becomes wellness, okay? And from Harry Potter, Albus Ambulder said, dark and difficult times lie ahead. Soon we must face the choice between what is right and what is easy. So kapag nag-ano kami dun sa love noon, what is easy? We don't do the love, but we know that's not right. Okay? And this time, top times don't last, but top people do. And to tell you, by the end of the semester, I would say I felt stressed out. I think this is the most stressful semester that we have. Work from home is really, we could say, stressful because you, you cannot differentiate work from home. Especially if you have family members who are also doing remote learning and remote teaching. As I've told you, I'm teaching in college. My wife is teaching special ed in New York City public school. I have a son who is in high school and I have a daughter who is in pre-K. Now look at our faces. Only one is enjoying this lockdown. This happens during April, okay? And there's always constant anxiety. I'm always anxious. There's, we, we felt helpless. During that time, every minute, I can hear the uh, emergency mobile. Daging may wang-wang dito sa bintana namin to the point that nagrarayon na lang ako ng another one bites the dust. God bless his or her soul. Okay? We really don't know what will happen to us during that uh, peak time of the pandemic from the last week of March to the second week of April. We're so happy right now that New York City flattened the curve. And we don't know what will happen once the school semester starts. I also have to meet some Filipino uh, students, graduate uh, chemistry students in CUNY, okay? because they also want to be connected as much as possible. All I can say is all efforts are worthwhile after I, re I read my uh, student evaluations because the students saw the efforts that I put during the transition, okay? Uh, during this transition, I would say constant communication, stay, const in stay in contact with your students by giving feedbacks to their inputs. That's why even if you do modular, kumustahin nyo sila, linggo-linggo. Because I always believe a good relationship requires two constant, and we teachers have to do it, constant communication and constant sacrifice, okay? Practice empathy. So what is empathy? So this is putting yourself in the shoes of the other. So especially during the pandemic time, 
why does he doesn't reply? So trying to put yourself, so maybe a family members is sick or maybe they just have one laptop and they have to, uh, what we call alternately use it. Okay, so empathy is seeing with the eyes of another, listening with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. And then equity. Okay. Even without the pandemic, I practice this already. I, I, I always try to help those students who need more help. Okay. And the problem that we have right now is digital inequality. So hindi porket may access na yung isa sa computer magaling na siya. We have to take into consideration that other people might not have the same opportunity at them. Okay? So the take-home message that I have, there's no easy solution to our current setup. We may adopt different uh, pedagogy, but the most important one is connection to the student. There is no one-size-fits-all solution to what we have right now. And again, student goals will always take center stage. I think that's the reason why we're here. Without the students, teachers are nothing. Okay? Sine serve natin yung students natin. Find positives in the current situation. Okay? Maybe we're working uh, from home. That's the time I was with my family. And then during the transition, I learned more. Okay? Pedagogies or teaching methods that will help me in my future teaching career. Okay? And then you always plan, plan, plan. We have a lot of plans right now because we have in paper a plan that is implemented. So if a decision comes out, there's another plan that should also be uh, prepared or ready. And as I have told you, assessment train. Okay? Alternatives to high stakes assessment. Paano natin sila grade And this one, you have to be prepared for this mental issue is going to be a real thing. I'm happy because my family is here. I have Netflix and I have the Beatles, okay, to get along because my last message that I have to you is in the forms of the Beatles song, okay? So this is the one that keep my sanity during the pandemic. So right now you're here because do you, uh, you, going, do you want to know a secret about how uh, we prepare for this transition. And after this webinar, you could say I should have known better. In my life, I never seen a pandemic like this. Yesterday, okay, is okay. But here, there, and everywhere, COVID-19 is everywhere. And I think we are in change with COVID-19. Okay, it's going to be a long, long time. Although they said by January, you come back. I, I doubt it. Okay, it's going to be a long and winding road for us. And from me to you, my advice when you get back, okay, you're going to carry that weight. Days, you will say, I'm so tired. It's all too much. It will be a hard day's night, eight days a week, okay? And you may say the government to the government, don't let me down, but I doubt it. They will give you their money. But I want to tell you, with a little help from your friends, you can work it out all together now, okay? Although some of your uh, colleagues will have no reply, give you misery or a hello, goodbye look, but let it be. Don't wait, ask for help. All you need is love. You come together and everything will get better because in the end, as one of the songs says there, okay, the love you take is equals to the love you make. Okay, so I'd like to thank the Bivar group with the Trukia and everyone who attended the webinar. I hope you learned something, okay? So these are just all the things you in the different dialects that we have there. So this is my email ad and the web page that I put there. Those are the materials that I have and some of the webinars that I have that I hope will be helpful to you. Thank you very much. Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. And thank you very much, Mr. Elmer Mojica. Now we will proceed to the question and answer portion. Our first question is from Ms. Arian Hasildo. Based on what you have tried so far, do you have a recommended class size during the new normal? This is the new normal that we have. 
25% occupancy. So in a laboratory class, our maximum room is 24. So what do we have there? Six students at the time. Now, luckily for me, I only have what? 12 students. So I can always have this shifting. So half of the schedule will be half of the class, the first half, and the second half of the class will be uh, the second half. I mean, the second half of the class will be the other half. Uh, we, we have to follow guidelines here. So that means we don't have this so-called ideal class size. It depends on the room, okay? Because if we don't follow that, we will be in trouble with the state and the CDC uh, officials. Okay, thank you, sir. Next question is from Ma'am Janice De Vera. What is the biggest challenge for this coming school year with the transition of new normal and how to adapt to these challenges? Well, the, the biggest challenge that we have on that time is how will the students take it? Okay, because for us, when, when we were explained, what are we going to do? So our mind was clear that, oh, it's not really the online thing where you have to prepare modules. So you just have to continue everything, but virtually. So the biggest challenge uh, for me is how do I tell my students? So before I tell that to my students, I survey them and then I ask them, what's the worry that you have if we have this kind of environment? And from their inputs, I was able to prepare myself during that one week transition, what I'm going to do. Because they said they don't want online learning. They did it before and they don't like it. And then they are worried that since it's online, if they have a question, how are they going to ask me? So I always tell them, you can always email it to me. And then all I do is I'm just going to what we call reply to you as back. And then whenever we do this class in chemistry where, where we have problem solving, what I do in a PowerPoint, I just posted this problem. And what I do during the class, we solve it together. So what I did, I record uh, those slides using the PowerPoint. So I posted there the problem and then I, I record voice myself there how to solve it and then using an iPad solve the problem. So it's just trying to what we call mimic the environment that we have. I think that's the biggest challenge. How will the students accept this transition? And for our last question from Sir Phil Sabayton, how do you make strong connections with your students, especially with those who are going through personal or family concerns? Uh, for me, I just bombarded it with the constant email until they reply. Okay? I, I think that's what makes it stressful for me as a teacher because when they don't reply, you try to imagine what happened to the students. I hope she's fine or he's fine because you don't know. But I have experience. One month, the student didn't didn't email me, and when he when she emailed me, he explained to me that I don't have any laptop, I don't have any internet. I have to go to the school and tell them. But by the time that I got the materials, it's already one month after. It's just constant communication. The, 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 the bad thing there is if they don't reply and it's stressful on your part if, you, if you're really concerned as a teacher, okay? Thank you so much, sir. And sorry po for the last question. May pahabol po tayong question. Sige. From sure. um, Alma Mabelen. Good day po. May I ask if you have some suggested interventions for those who will be using modular, modular distant learning? Uh, can you repeat the question again? Um, intervention? May I ask if you have some suggested interventions okay. for those who will be using modular distance learning? Okay, so in the modular distance learning, since I didn't do it, okay? So usually you have your modules, right? So you're going to give it to the students. So I would suggest uh, monitor them from time to time. Maybe you can have a Facebook group and then every week, so how are you doing? Because this is, this is the challenge that you have there. Those students, 
at their age, if they're not motivated, they're not going to do anything. Okay, so if you're going to give them the modular, the, the, the modular material, the module material, okay, I doubt if they will answer it right away. Because that's the challenge of the online. Okay, they have a flexible uh, schedule, but you have to be mature enough to be responsible to do that stuff. And students at uh, college levels or younger, they don't have that motivation. They want to be motivated by their teacher. Or sometimes when they see their classmate, they got motivated. So I would suggest the intervention that you have is monitor them from time to time. Okay, thank you, sir. And this is this will be the last question. <laughs> uh, okay, from from Ma Maricel Bautista, uh, can you give at least five important ways to sustain a learning community? Uh, first, uh, connect with them right away. Connection is the most important thing. Once you establish connection, you can establish community. And then once you establish the connection, the next thing that you're going to do is sustain the connection, build relationship, okay? So if you ask them, if you give them a module, I would suggest ask them to submit maybe if they can uh, every week, some materials to submit, if not, maybe monthly, but you have to at least uh, sustain that connection that you have because sometimes the students, they got motivated when somebody reminds them, oh, kailangan nyo na mag-submit, natapos mo na ba dyan? Okay? Just say hi, hello, as, as much as possible. Uh, the thing is right now, this work from home thing, hindi mo na maano yung professional and personal relationship. Sometimes magkahalo na yan eh. Okay? And then you continue to sustain and then be understandable. Kupag kung hindi kaya nila gawin agad kasi may sakit yung mga magulang, and then, what else did I put there? Uh, if you need help, kung hindi mo kaya i-develop yung materials, you, I mean yung mga estudyante, ask them to collaborate or at least be in contact with their classmate. Because uh, there will be a community not only between you as a teacher and the students, but with the students and another students. Students is in a much better uh, situation if they are in a community. We have this so-called by Bigotsky community of learners thing. Okay, so I think you lang yung magigive kong advice hindi ata umabot sa lima. Okay, thank you so much, Sir Elmer. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have for now. Any last remind reminders to our viewers for today, sir? Well, I know yung pinagdadaanan yung ngayon. Uh, it happened to me during the transition to what we called remote learning. But I can tell you, uh, I always believe in us Filipino. Gagawa at gagawa tayo ng paraan. Sabi nga nila, pag gusto may paraan, pag ayaw may dahilan. Okay? And if ever okay, you're going to ask for help, there will always be people who are willing to help. I would suggest you build your own group. Okay, let's say high school teacher na nagtuturo ng math, high school teacher na nagtuturo ng chem, high school teacher na nagtuturo ng social studies. Okay, you will be in a much better place if you work together. Okay, and I'm more than willing to give you any help that I can. Okay, problema sa akin, yung mayaman na ako sa pangalan ko, Rico, kung mapera ako, bibigyan din ko kayong pera, kaso wala tayo nun eh. <laughs> so maraming maraming salamat and uh, it will be hard, but it is possible. I always believe in us, Filipino. Okay? Kaya kaya natin to. <laughs> okay, there we have it. Uh, on behalf of Vibal Group, I would like to thank our speaker for today for, his, for this insightful learning session. It is an honor to have you with us today. And to all our Kabibal viewers, all thanks to you for your continuous patronage to our daily learning session. Muli, maraming maraming salamat at magandang araw sa ating lahat. Thank you.